This information is designed to provide accurate and authoritative information with regard to the subject matter covered. It is offered with the understanding that the presenters are not engaged in rendering legal, accounting, or other professional services. If legal advice or other expert advice is required, the services of a competent professional should be sought. Well, good evening and welcome everyone. My name is James Orr, and tonight we're going to be going over a really interesting presentation. This is the six ways to buy homes without new bank financing. We're going to be covering a lot of different creative strategies for acquiring homes, and the particular focus of this particular presentation is on buying a home creatively, not necessarily when you're a real estate investor trying to buy with no money down, but just in general, the different strategies for buying homes. This could be for a home for you to live in. It could also be a home for you to buy as an investment, but we're not going to be talking specifically about investing, which is one of my favorite topics. We're going to be talking about buying homes creatively without new bank financing, even if you're buying it to live in yourself. So let's jump right into the presentation. I've got a lot of stuff to cover and a relatively short amount of time to do it. This presentation is put out in two different formats. It's the exact same presentation. However, one is an audio only version. And you should be able to get the overwhelming majority of the information from the audio version only. And so what I'm doing is I'm actually recording the audio and the slides at the same time. And I will separate out so that there's just an audio version so that you can listen to it in your car, or on your uh, favorite mobile device. Um, but you'll be able to go ahead and listen to the audio version and get the overwhelming majority of the presentation. However, if you're a visual learner and you want to see the PowerPoint slides, there is a video version of this that I'm putting together. I'm recording it right now as we go through it. And there are PowerPoint slides for it and a uh, PowerPoint handout as well. So you can go ahead and listen to the audio version or you can listen to the uh, video version and watch the PowerPoint slides. I would probably prefer to listen to the audio version. I like uh, audio and I like to uh, get out and exercise a little bit while I listen to things like this. But whatever works for you, there are two different versions. And you should be able to get by with just listening to the audio or just watching the video. You do not need to listen to uh, the video version or you don't need to listen to both of them, definitely, because uh, one of them will be fine. So you can access either one. All right, let's go over the objectives of what we're going to be going over tonight in this presentation. Uh, there's really three primary objectives. Number one is you're going to learn about the six strategies to buy a home without getting new bank financing. We're going to talk about those in detail. You'll learn the pros and cons of each of the six strategies. We're going to go over some of the uh, benefits of doing one strategy over another. And then finally, you're going to learn how to find these properties so that you can start buying properties using the six strategies. So those are the three primary objectives. We're going to cover those uh, throughout this presentation. Let's get started. Okay, so let's go over the six creative buying strategies. The six strategies are owner financing, wrap financing, loan assumption, the rent to own, lease to own, lease option, and lease purchase family, the agreement for deed, bond for deed, contract for deed, and installment land contract family, and then finally, the most controversial of the group, we'll cover that later, and that is subject to. So what we're going to be doing in this presentation, we're going to be going through each one of these six different creative buying strategies. We're going to go over uh, what they are, what are some of the pros and cons of each, and then how to actually find properties that you can buy with each one of these strategies. So let's jump right into it. Let's talk about the pros and cons of these strategies as we go through and describe what each one of the strategies are. Let's start with owner financing. The best way I can describe owner financing is when the seller of a property acts just like a bank would and they allow you to make payments in order to purchase the property. Now, in the case of, of buying a property on owner financing, you do get title to the property. You do have ownership of the property. Some of the other strategies we're going to talk about, uh, like rent to own, lease to own, lease option, lease purchase, you are not the owner of the property up front. 
you are just renting the property during a rent to own and then eventually you have the right to buy a property with owner financing that's not true the seller is acting just like a bank the seller gives you ownership of the property they deed you over the title to the property and you make payments on that property if you fail to pay the seller can go and foreclose on you and take back ownership of the property so usually the seller gets a promissory note which is secured by a deed of trust here in Colorado, we use deed of trust state, or in other states, you may be talking about mortgages. So if you're in another state that uses mortgages, you'd get a mortgage on the property. And basically, the seller is accepting payments over time in order to do the owner financing. Does every owner want a down payment? No, most of them will. So most of the time, you're gonna be giving the owner a down payment, and then you're gonna be making payments to them monthly, usually, over time although it can vary too. I mean, there are some sellers that might want to do uh, quarterly payments or, or twice a year payments or even yearly payments. But most common, you're gonna require a down payment and you're gonna make monthly payments to the seller and that's what owner financing is. My definition of owner financing is that you need to have a free and clear property. So the seller must not have an existing mortgage on their property at all. That's going to be different than when we talk about wrap financing, where the seller still may have a small mortgage on the property. Okay, but owner financing, they have to own it free and clear. They cannot have an underlying mortgage on the property if they're going to offer you owner financing. Now, in case you're wondering, how common is it to have a property that's free and clear that does not have an existing mortgage on it? Well, about one third, according to the 2005 U.S. Census data, about one third of all the properties in the United States are free and clear. That means that one out of every three properties do not have a mortgage and could accept owner financing. Okay, so if you're gonna go into the multiple listing service, we're gonna talk about finding these deals later, but let's use this as an example. If you're gonna go into the multiple listing service, which is where real estate agents list properties for sale, and you're gonna try to find an owner financing transaction, and we'll talk about how to go and search for those. It's actually really easy for owner financing at least in our local multiple listing service. Your local market may be a little bit different. But finding owner financing properties is relatively easy in our, in our market. You can go find a property. The challenge will be, if you're trying to do this with low money down, is coming up with enough down payment in order to cover, at a minimum, the real estate commission that's due. Usually about 6% of the purchase is for the real estate commission. Plus, there's probably 1% or 2% in closing costs from the seller side. So in order to buy a property with owner financing, before the seller gets anything as a down payment to, as collateral, as uh, something to say, I'm serious about buying it, and you know, if you don't buy it, they actually get to keep a little bit of money, you need to have more than 8% down, let's say. 6% for the real estate commission and 1% or 2% for closing costs. So if that's the case has to be more than 8% before the seller would even see anything. Okay, So each seller is totally different. And of course, if you find a property outside the MLS, that's different because there's no real estate commission that's necessarily due. If you're, if you're doing it yourself, if you're not bringing in a real estate agent to help you find the property, then there's no real estate commission that's due. And so you can actually do owner financing with less down or where the seller gets more of the down payment that you're bringing to the table as collateral in case you do not perform on the loan. Okay. The way to find owner financing, there's an easy way to do it in the MLS, and we'll talk about that later, but usually it's a lot of manually calling of sellers or the listing agent if it's actually in the MLS and just asking the sellers if they're willing to consider owner financing. Only a small number of sellers are going to say, I would accept owner financing. A much larger pool of sellers would consider it especially if their property's been sitting on the market for 90 days, 120 days, 180 days or more, and you come to them and say, listen, I see your property's on the market. I'm interested in buying it. Ideally, you have a down payment you can offer them. And you say, uh, you know, I've got 10% down, but I need six more months on my job in order to be able to qualify for a loan. Would you consider owner financing for a period of time? Maybe it's a short period of owner financing. Or maybe you say to them, look, you know, um, I see you own your property free and clear. And uh, I'd, I'd like to be able to buy your property. And I'd like to know if you'd consider um, giving some owner financing and acting like the bank 
And uh, instead of getting, you know, instead of taking the money from the sale of the property and putting it into a CD in the bank, which would earn you at the time of this recording, you know, 1%, maybe 2%, um, you know, I could pay you 4%, 5%, 6% interest. And so it's actually better for you and it's better for me. And so you can approach sellers and do that. But it's a manual process in most cases. I mean, there's certain properties you can find that are advertised as owner financing, but there's a relatively small pool. So you're not going to find, at least in our current market here, we're in Fort Collins, Colorado. Population here, um, if I had to guess, probably 150,000 people. And you're not going to find more than half dozen, a dozen owner financing properties at any given time. So there's not a huge number of them. But there are a very large number of sellers that, if you approach them, would consider it that have not necessarily advertised their property that they would consider owner financing. Okay, so that's owner financing. Now, next one we're going to cover is wrap financing. Remember, wrap financing is different than owner financing in that if the seller still has a mortgage on their property and they're offering you some type of owner financing, what they're really doing is they're wrapping the financing that they already have in place and then they're allowing you to do owner financing to them. So let's take a look at that. So owner financing, when there is an underlying loan, is called wrap financing. It's very similar to owner financing, except the seller still has that underlying loan in the property. The seller is still acting like a bank, and the seller should continue to make the payments on their original loan. If they don't make the payments on their underlying loan, then the original lender, the bank usually, may foreclose on the property. That's something you want to know if you're buying a property and you're wrapping the financing that's in place. So let's say as an example, and if you happen to be looking at the visualization online, um, there is a circle with a smaller circle inside of it showing you that the big circle is the new loan that the seller is giving to you and the small circle inside is what the seller has as an original loan and they're wrapping it with your bigger loan. Okay, so let's say as an example, it's a $200,000 property and the seller still owes $50,000 on it. You know, let's say they're making payments of a few hundred dollars a month on a $50,000 loan, and they're going to offer you financing for the full $200,000. So you're going, to make, you're going to make payments to the seller on a $200,000 loan. They still owe $50,000 on their property. So really, what the seller needs to do, let's say the seller is collecting $1,000 a month from you in order to buy the $200,000 property, they would take part of their thousand dollar a month that they're receiving, maybe it's three hundred dollars, and they're gonna send that over to the bank who has their fifty thousand dollar mortgage. And so they're really netting the difference between whatever their underlying payment is and the payment that you're making them on their loan. So about seven hundred dollars in this example. It's a purely fictitious example. Okay, but can you see how there's still a fifty thousand dollar on a property? The seller still has that first loan, and then they're coming in saying, listen, okay, I'll finance you. I'll give you wrap financing. I'll give you owner financing on the property where I have an underlying loan, and I'm willing to accept $200,000 as the purchase price, and you're gonna pay me $1,000 a month for whatever time period you agree. And for that every $1,000 that you pay, they're gonna then turn around and pay $300 on that underlying loan. Just like regular owner financing, you're gonna get title to the property. So you're gonna be an owner. You're going to have ownership. Yes, there's going to be a $50,000 mortgage on the property to the bank that the seller had. That's going to stay there. And yes, the seller is going to have another $150,000 mortgage, whatever the difference is between the total amount, for you. Okay, The seller is going to get a promissory note that says, I agree to pay $150,000 at whatever percent interest rate it is, or in, in most cases, they may even wrap it and, and have you make the payment underneath. Uh, they may wrap it and they'll, they'll make the payment underneath. And it's still going to be secured by a deed of trust. Now, each seller is going to be different, just like with regular owner financing. Uh, many of them are going to want a down payment. Some of them may be willing to do it without a down payment. But in most cases, you're going to need a down payment for doing wrap financing. Okay. How do you find these? We're going to talk about that in detail here in a little bit. But usually, you're still manually calling sellers or the listing agent, and you're going to ask them whether or not they would consider wrap financing. 
Okay, when you're calling up and you're doing owner financing or wrap financing, you're usually asking them, do you still owe a little bit on the property? If they still owe something, you're talking about wrap financing usually. If they don't owe anything, you're usually talking about owner financing. Okay. Uh, when you talk to your attorney in a second here, I'm going to talk to you about the importance of bringing in an attorney and answering the questions you have about legal issues regarding doing these creative transactions. And they're much more complicated, by the way, than doing a traditional, I'm going to go to the bank, get a new loan type of transactions. So you're going to want to definitely bring in an attorney. I would just budget for it. But when you go and you talk to your attorney, you're going to want to you know, ask them some of the questions about the underlying financing. What happens if the seller doesn't pay? What happens if uh, the original lender decides to call the loan due? Like if there's an acceleration clause in it, due on sale clause or due on transfer clause. So you want to talk to your lender about that, your uh, attorney about that rather. And uh, I can definitely provide for clients a kind of frequently asked questions list to uh, of like talking points for your attorney. In fact, I've done that for a couple clients before. So. Uh, my clients can definitely call me and get that list. The agent that you're working with, if you happen to be working with an agent, um, ask them for some of the questions that they'd recommend you talk to your attorney about. Uh, not that that's a comprehensive list, but it's a good starting point as a list of different questions you can talk to your attorney about. Okay, So that's owner financing and wrap financing. Remember, owner financing, free and clear. Wrap financing is owner financing where they still have an underlying mortgage on it. Okay, Let's talk about loan assumption. So loan assumption is when you are formally accepting responsibility from the original lender with the lender's permission to start making payments on that loan. Okay. Now loan assumptions have not been very popular in the last decade or so, primarily because interest rates have been coming down. And as interest rates come down, people are much more inclined to go get a new loan at a lower interest rate than take over and assume responsibility for an existing loan at a higher interest rate. But what happens when you're at very low interest rates and then interest rates change and they start heading up? And you can go in and formally assume responsibility for a loan at 4% and interest rates are now at 8% it becomes much more attractive for you to go out there and find a loan that you can assume. And so I have a feeling loan assumption is going to become more popular as interest rates start to go up again. They're relatively rare, but you still see them. So you'll still see in the multiple listing service where real estate agents list properties for sale that a loan is assumable, FHA assumable loan. And then that means that you should contact the listing agent or have your agent contact the listing agent and talk to them about what the qualifications are for assuming that loan. Usually what happens is there is a fee in order to do the assumption. Uh, oftentimes it's 1% of the loan amount. And then you are responsible. You go and you apply to the bank and you get responsibility to start making payments on that existing loan. The loan gets transferred to your name and you are the new borrower on the property. The bank gives you permission to do so. A little bit different than when we're going to talk about buying a property subject to the existing financing later, which is much more controversial. It's basically buying the property and not getting the bank's permission, not getting uh, the, not, not taking responsibility for it from directly from the bank. Okay, that's subject to, and we're gonna talk about that as an alternative later. But loan assumption is where you go and you formally assume responsibility. Again, just like with owner financing and wrap financing, you are getting title to the property. So you are the owner of the property and you are formally assuming the loan. Now the seller may or may not, depending on how it's structured, recourse versus non-recourse assumption, have still have responsibility for the loan. So in some cases, if you don't pay on the loan, the seller may have to come up and kind of make good. Um, that's recourse, if there's a recourse assumption. So this, the original seller may still have recourse on the loan. If there's non-recourse, then basically if you default on the loan that you've assumed, then that's between you and the bank, and it's not going to go well for you, but at least the seller's not involved anymore. Okay, so if you're the seller, if you're looking at this video or listening to this audio, and you happen to be the seller, and you're thinking about doing a loan assumption, you need to be careful that you actually have recourse or non-recourse on the assumption. Are you still responsible if the buyer the person who comes in and assumes the loan does not pay. Definitely want to read what you're signing to find out if you're doing that. Have your attorney talk to you about that. 
Now, some local banks, more so local banks than national type banks, but some local banks may be willing to consider an assumption even if the original loan does not allow it. So you have a loan, and the loan is a non-assumable loan from a local bank. However, you go to them and you say, you know, I really want to buy this property. And I really like the interest rate that's on the loan. I really like that they've already paid off five years of the 25-year term or 30-year term. Would you consider allowing me to formally assume this loan? Some local banks may be willing to work that out with you. Especially if you're a good client of that bank, you have an account there, you've been with them for a while, and they want to work with you. Okay, so in some cases, they may be willing to let you assume it, even if the original loan does not say that. Okay, now, what about a loan assumption combined with some owner financing? So it would be like almost wrap financing. Okay, so let's say it's a $200,000 property. The seller has a $100,000 loan. That's assumable, but the property's worth 200000 So you're not going to buy it and just take over the hundred thousand dollar loan you're not going to just assume that because you still owe the seller a hundred thousand so maybe what you might structure is a combination of a loan assumption and some owner financing so you say okay listen mr seller here's what i'm going to do i'm going to go and qualify with the bank i'm going to take over payments on that first one hundred thousand dollar mortgage with the bank that will no longer be in your name you won't have to worry about it anymore and then i still owe you a hundred thousand dollars so what I'd be willing to do is pay you that $100,000 in equal payments of $500, some arbitrary number. You have to go figure out what it would be. And that would be at an interest rate of, calculate out what that would be. And that would be over a term of whatever the term would be. And so that could be your offer where you're combining a loan assumption. You're taking over the existing loan. And you're also getting some type of owner financing for the balance. So now each seller may be different. But some sellers may want a down payment to do loan assumption. What happens if they have a loan on the property? Let's say it's a $198,000 loan, and the property's worth $200,000, and you're going to go in there and assume the loan. Do you really need to have a huge down payment in order to make that work? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe the seller wants you to put up 10% down, $20,000 on the purchase price, and actually pay down part of that loan in order to have you, in order to be willing to let you assume the loan. You know, why might they want to do that? Well, if they have recourse on the loan, maybe they want to do that. If it's a non-recourse loan, I think you can make a good argument that, no, that's not required. I'll take over the existing $198,000 loan. However, I don't need you to, I don't need to put up 10%. Now that two thousand dollar difference, you know, they owe one ninety eight and it's they're buying it for two hundred thousand. Might they want you to come up with two thousand? Sure. What gets a little bit tricky? Imagine trying to buy this two hundred thousand dollar property from the multiple listing service. Well, real estate commission is due, right? Six percent of that sales price, plus the seller's got their closing costs. So let's say you need to come up with, let's say the real estate commission is the only issue. Let's say somehow you agreed to pay closing costs. So you got to come up with 6 uh, 6% of $200,000. You got to come up with $12,000. If you're only putting up $2,000 because that's the difference between 198 and 200, where's the other $10,000 going to come from in order to pay the real estate agents, both the seller's real estate agent and your buying real estate agent in order to get the transaction to go through? How do you work that out? Do you think the seller is going to come to the table and say, I got it. I'll pay the $10,000. Not usually. So you got to start thinking through when you're making these offers, you know, you're know, you trying to do these transactions where everybody wins. Okay, so there's some considerations. Of course, talk to your agent when you're structuring these, or if you're not working with an agent, think these through as the different ways to structure it. Uh, of course, if you happen to be working with me, I'll be talking to you about it in detail. Um, usually, in order to find these, we're going to talk a little bit more later about how to find these types of transactions. Um, but usually, it's just like the other two, owner financing, wrap financing. You need to call, manually call the sellers or the listing agents and ask them if they're willing to do this. In our local MLS, there's not even a way to search for loan assumptions. You could search just for the word loan assumption in the description, but there's not like a little checkbox where you could say, show me the properties that are marked as assumable loan. So you need to manually call 
sellers or listing agents, or you need to look in the description or search through the description. Um, but more often than not, you'd call the seller and you'd ask them, is your loan assumable? And you're not usually doing this where you're just looking for those. Usually you're doing it as part of, you know, would you consider owner financing? Do you know if your loan's assumable? And you're asking multiple questions to see if you can work one of these creative strategies when you're talking to a particular seller or the listing agent in most cases. Okay? Now, how many of these loan assumptions are qualifying loan assumptions, meaning you need to go to the bank and fill out paperwork and actually qualify to be able to take over payments on the loan, and how many of them are non-qualifying, where the bank's like, we don't care if you're qualified or not, you just sign this paperwork, maybe you pay a fee, and you actually are now taking over responsibility and making payments on that loan. How many of those are non-qualifying? The overwhelming majority of loan assumptions out there are what's called qualifying loan assumption, meaning that you need to qualify in order to be able to take them over. So you need to have good credit, good job history, all the things that you might otherwise want to do in order to get a loan. So one of the questions that might come up, well, why are we talking about this if you need to go and qualify for these types of loans? Well, one of the reasons we're talking about it is because if it's a 4% loan and interest rates now are at 8%, it's still very attractive to go out there and qualify and take over a 4% loan than it is to take over an 8% loan or to get a new 8% loan because that's what the new rates are. So even if you are still qualifying, it may make sense to do that. Or maybe you're qualifying at a lower dollar amount which you can qualify for. Maybe you're qualified to be able to buy a property or be, maybe you're qualified in order to get a loan at 100000 so you can go qualify and assume that loan and then maybe the owner financing for the difference would allow you to go and structure it that way. Maybe you're not fully qualified to do a $200,000 loan. Okay, But if, you're, if the reason you're looking at these creative strategies, owner financing, wrap financing, the rent-to-own family, the installment land contract family are subject to is because you don't have the ability in order to go qualify for a loan well, then loan assumption is probably not your top one to look at, your top strategy. In most cases, you'd want to look at the other strategies. But in some cases, you may find, you may come across one of those rare non-qualifying loan assumptions. And usually, they're private individuals that have non-qualifying loan assumptions. Usually, it's not um, institutional lenders like banks or, or mortgage companies. Okay, So that's loan assumption. Let's talk about one of the most popular ones, the one that really most everyone thinks of when they start hearing about you know, creative transactions or buying without getting a new bank loan. And that's the rent-to-own, lease-to-own, lease-option, lease-purchase family. Let's jump in and talk about those. All right, let's talk about rent-to-own, lease-to-own, lease-option, lease-purchase. Actually, there are differences between lease-option and lease-purchase. Rent to own and lease to own are kind of like the generic ways of describing this process. You're gonna be renting a property until you eventually own it. Or you're gonna be leasing a property until you eventually own it. That's rent to own or lease to own. They're like the generic interchangeable ways of saying that. However, there is a difference between lease option and lease purchase, which is the more technical way of describing a rent to own or lease to own. And just to be clear, a lease option you can say that's a rent to own or a lease to own. Okay? A lease purchase, you could say that's a rent to own or a lease to own. However, a lease option is not a lease purchase. Even though the overwhelming majority of people use them interchangeably. And if you happen to be looking at the slides, there is a there is kind of like a visual showing you that a lease option is a lease with an option agreement and a lease purchase is a lease with a purchase contract. So one of them is like a option. You have the right, but not the obligation to buy. And a lease with a purchase contract or a lease purchase is a lease with a purchase contract that implies that you are going to buy. You have a contract that says, I will be buying this property at this point in time. Okay. So the big picture overview of how a rent to own, lease to own type works is you're going to find a seller that will allow you to lease the property over a period of time, and then they're going to agree to sell you the property at some point in the future. That some point in the future is completely negotiable. Could be three months, could be one month, could be a week, could be a year, could be two years, could be five years, could be 10 years. It is, this strategy is probably the most common one that you're gonna find. It's the one that probably most real estate agents and real estate brokers know about. Because a lot of them don't know about the subtleties of owner financing and wrap financing, uh, loan assumption, installment land contracts, and definitely not subject to. 
Okay, but rent to own, you talk to him about you know doing a lease option or lease purchase. The overwhelming majority of real estate agents, when you say that, are going to have a general sense of what's going on. Okay, now unlike owner financing, wrap financing, and loan assumption, which we've already covered, you do not get title to the property. You are not the owner of the property when you do a rent to own. You are renting the property until you close on the property and you buy it. When you close on it, you buy it, you get ownership. During the rental period, you are not the owner. You're a renter. You're a tenant. In fact, from the real estate investor side, we call people that are on a rent to own a tenant buyer, meaning that they are a tenant with the intention of becoming a buyer on the property. Call them tenant buyers. So usually you're going to be renting the property and you do not get title until you actually buy. Now, this may be able to be combined with another strategy like owner financing, but it doesn't usually happen that way. So for example, let's say you had a seller that owned their property free and clear. They did not have a mortgage on it. And you come to them and say, listen, I'd like to buy your property. And they say, how much money you got down? And you tell them, I've got $5,000 down, $200,000 property, let's say. I've got $5,000 down. Let's say the seller is pretty savvy. And he says, you know, I don't feel comfortable doing owner financing with you with just 5% down. It's actually not even 5%. It's 5,000 down is what we said. It's 2.5% down. So I don't feel comfortable doing owner financing with only $5,000 down. But I'll tell you what. I would be willing to do owner financing if you were able to raise enough money to get 10% down, $20,000. And in the meantime, I will rent you the property and I will give you an option to be able to buy it from me for some agreed upon price, probably 200000 And you'll pay me, let's say it's $1,200 a month rent, and anything more you want to add on top of that $1,200 a month rent, I will put aside as a non-refundable, in many cases, purchase deposit toward you building up to a 10% down payment. As soon as you get the 10% down, what I will allow you to do is switch over and I will provide you owner financing for the balance of 180000 And then we'll switch over to owner financing. You'll then get transfer of title. You'll be the owner of the property and you'll pay me just like you would a bank for a period of time. And whatever the terms are of that owner financing are negotiable. You would decide that with the seller. Okay, But that's kind of like a combination of you're going to be renting to own until you're ready to buy and then you're going to be converting the rent to own into a purchase. And then the twist on this one is that the purchase actually is owner financing. So you're combining two of them in order to get a very creative transaction where you're doing a rent to own and instead of having to go out and get a new bank loan a year, two years, three years from now, you're actually able to convert it to owner financing. Oftentimes when you're doing a rent to own or lease to own, lease option, lease purchase, oftentimes the seller is going to be asking for higher than fair market rent. Let's take a look at that for a minute. So let's say the rent on a property is 1200 But the payments, if you were going to go out and get a new loan on the property with a decent interest rate, might be $1,400 a month. $200 a month more than what the rent would be. So from the seller's perspective, let's kind of look at it from their side for a second. From the seller's perspective, do they want to make sure that you can afford $1,400 a month? Because if you go and you rent the property from them for 1200 a month, knowing full well that with interest rates at all-time lows right now, at the time of this recording, and who knows what they'll be when you listen to this, but right now interest rates are at all-time lows, if the payments at all-time low interest rates are going to be $200 more than what rent is, they would be doing you a disservice to allow you to rent to own that property, to go in there, rent it for $1,200 a month, knowing that you could not afford $1,400 a month payments, which is what your payments would be if you went and got a new loan. Because eventually, with a rent-to-own, you have to go and cash the seller out. Well, I shouldn't say that. You don't have to. You could really sell your interest in the rent-to-own and try to make a profit that way. But, I mean, that's kind of like subtlety and, and debating the real point. The point is, eventually, you're going to want to go out and actually close on that property to own it. Because right now, you, all you're doing is renting it, with the option or renting it with a purchase agreement to be able to buy it. Eventually, you're going to want to exercise your option, in most cases, or exercise your right to purchase it, purchase contract. And if the payments that would be if you were going to go buy the property are more than what rent is, you could be in a lot of trouble. You could be in a situation where you have a rent to own, 
and you're supposed to buy the property within a year, and you can't afford the $1,400 a month payments. So even if you could go out and get a loan for it, you really can't afford it. So a seller may say, okay, rent in this, mar- rent in this marketplace would be about $1,200 a month. However, you're going to be paying me $1,400 a month. And maybe you work out something with the seller. And by the way, the f- there is a lot of variation of flexibility in how you can structure these. I'm just kind of throwing out some examples. But I realize each situation is different. Each one is its own negotiation. And it's, there's kind of like give and take during this whole process. So um, don't think that you're automatically going to do it one way or automatically do it another way. But in this case, in this example, let's say that you agree. The seller says, okay, rent would be 1200 However, you're going to pay me $1,400 a month. And what I'm going to do as a seller, I'm going to credit you that $200 a month extra toward the purchase price. So each month that you pay me the $1,400, $200 of that is going to go toward you buying the property. So over the course of a year, you'd have paid in about $2,400 toward the purchase. So they're making sure that you can afford to buy the house. And then you can go show your lender, look, I've been making $1,400 a month payments. But $200 of that might go and be applied to the property. Now, what if the seller's like, no, you, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to give you any credit. I'm not going to give you the $200 credit. The rent is $1,200, but you're going to pay me $1,400. Because the 200 more that you're paying is giving you the option to buy. You know, it's part of an ongoing option fee. That's the premium I'm getting in order to give you the right to buy the property. Is that fair and reasonable? Well, it's open to negotiation. Whether you decide that's fair or whether the seller decides that's fair, it's really a matter of whether you guys agree. Completely negotiable. Because it's not unusual to put down an option fee in order to be able to get the option to be able to buy the property. How much is an option fee? Whatever you negotiate. Could be a couple thousand dollars, could be ten thousand dollars, could be fifteen thousand, could be twenty thousand, could be a hundred thousand. Depending on the property and the situation. So to think that you're gonna pay a two hundred dollar per month premium in order to be able to buy the property in a year from now might not be unreasonable. And if you think that that's a really bad deal for the buyer, let's take a look at this. Let's say you agree on a price of 200000 In our current marketplace here in Fort Collins, properties are going up about 3% a year over a long period of time. So a $200,000 property, a year from now, with appreciation, if it goes up 3%, is going to be worth about $206,000. So if you agree on a purchase price today, it's worth 200 today. In a year from now, it's probably going to be worth about 206. And you're telling the seller, okay, I'm going to pay you $1,400 a month rent. And you know that's $200 a month higher than what fair market rent would be. You just paid in $2,400. That's $200 a month times 12 months. $2,400 in order to be able to buy it for $200,000. It's worth 206. So you actually come out $3,600 ahead because it's worth $3,600 more than the $2,400 you just added to the $200,000 purchase price. If that's confusing, go ahead and rewind it and listen to it again. But basically, I just told you that even paying the $200 more per month, if the property went up 3% over the course of the year, you're still coming out ahead. Okay? Okay. Which leads me to my next point. The purchase price may be higher than the current fair market value. In some markets, the properties are going up more than 3%. You know, some markets, they, they go crazy and they go up 10% a year. Well, if you're in a market where property values are going up like crazy and they go up 10% a year, a $200,000 today is going to be worth $220,000 a year from now. $20,000 more. So if a seller says the property is really worth two hundred. dollars but you're going to actually sign a contract. You're going to have the option to be able to buy the property for 210. That's more than what it probably would appraise for today. But you say, listen, I, I property values are going crazy. I'd rather lock in 210 than a year from now when I'm able to go get a loan to be looking at properties that are worth 220. I'm actually $10,000 ahead. So whatever you negotiate between you and the seller when you're going to buy the properties like this, are up to you and the seller. But the purchase price may be higher than the current fair market value. Rent may be higher than the current fair market rent. Each seller is different. Some sellers would consider a rent to own with a relatively small down payment. 
And when I represent clients, buyer clients, I can make a pretty compelling case that you should be able to do it with a relatively small down payment. Although I will tell you that it's easier to convince a seller the larger the down payment you have. From a persuasion standpoint, the more down payment you bring to a rent to own, lease to own, lease option, lease purchase, or any of these strategies really, the more compelling it becomes. How do you find these rent to own, lease to own, lease option, lease purchase? Well, in our local MLS at least, there is a checkbox to be able to search for lease purchase. Very small number of properties are offered on lease purchase uh, that are marked that way. So really the way to do it is to manually call up sellers or their listing agent and ask them if they would consider lease option, lease purchase. So usually talking to them, um, just calling them up and asking them if they consider, or you're asking them if they would consider any of these types of strategies where that is one of them. But the, the lease option, lease purchase, when you're talking to other sellers or listing agents, both of them, a lot of them understand lease option, lease purchase more so than the other strategies. So it's often best to kind of approach them with that and then say, you know, whatever works out best, you know, I consider owner financing or wrap financing or, you know, lease option, lease purchase, um, any of those, but, you know, let's talk about the lease option, lease purchase first, and then we can kind of change the structure to see what really works. Okay. So that is the overview of rent to own, lease option, lease purchase. Um, and I think that that covers it in some good detail. Of course, there's lots of subtlety to this. There's lots of negotiation points. And so when you talk to your real estate agent, if you're going to work with a real estate agent and find these, you're going to want to ask them a lot of questions and kind of go into detail about how it would work. But there's lots of ways, lots of variety of structure these. Um, it's an extremely creative endeavor. Um, it's not like a traditional cash purchase, um, which there's a limited number of things you could do. There's lots more to do when you talk about these. All right, let's move on to the next group. The next group is agreement for deed, bond for deed, contract for deed, or what we call here in Colorado, the installment land contract. The best way I can describe this is, have you ever gone out and bought a car with financing where you made payments to the bank or to the lender, and then once you made your payments, then they transferred title of the car to you? So you didn't really own your car while you were making the payments on it. You were making payments, and then at the end, they gave you title to the car. That's sort of what this is but for houses. So you have an agreement with the seller. You say, okay, Mr. Seller, you're going to sell me the property. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make you payments of $1,000 a month for 360 months. And then when I'm done doing that, then you're going to transfer ownership of the property from you to me. So we have a contract for me to get the deed, contract for deed. We have an agreement between you and I of $1,000 a month for 360 months to get the deed of the property, agreement for deed, okay? We call that installment land contract here in Colorado, okay? So one way to look at it is it's almost like you don't really have ownership of the property for a period of time and you're making payments to the seller and then they eventually transfer title. Okay, so that is the agreement for deed, bond for deed, contract for deed, installment of the contract. Most of the time, you're not going to run into those. And in the MLS, if you're trying to find those, there's no easy way to search for them. So you have to either read through the descriptions manually or search through those, and there's very few of them, or you need to call the listing agent and seller and talk to them about it. And usually it's an education process unless somebody has done those before. And then, even then, it's sometimes hard to make sure you're on the same page. Okay. All right, let's talk about the most controversial of the group, and that is buying a property subject to the existing financing. Now, I will tell you right up front, some attorneys and real estate agents will not do these. Okay. So be really careful who you talk to about them. Um, I do know attorneys here in Colorado who will do them. Um, it's a very common strategy used by a lot of real estate investors when they're buying properties. But basically what you're doing is you're buying the property and you're leaving the existing financing in place. You're buying it subject to the existing financing on the property. So let's talk about uh, probably one of the more common strategies or co one of the more common situations where this could come up. I'm going to paint you a picture. I'm going to tell you a little story about a particular seller and how this could be a good situation for them and how it could be a good situation for you if you were looking to buy it. So you've got a seller. You've got a person who owns a property. 
they owe, let's say, $190,000, and the property's worth $200,000. Okay? Uh, they're working a job. Everything's going along great. Then all of a sudden, without notice, they lose their job. They don't have any savings. So they say, huh, if I were to take this $200,000 property and I were to try to sell it with a real estate agent, I'd have to come up with you know, a 6% commission on a $200,000 sale, which would be $12,000. I'd actually be negative. I'd have to come to the table with money in order to pay off the loan and do the property and sell the property. So they look at it really hard and they say, you know, I think I've already got some late bills from something else and I had some medical issues and my, my credit's kind of ruined. You know, what I might do is I might just go ahead and give this property back to the bank. I'm going to let them foreclose on me and I'm going to go move to Florida and live with my parents. And you, as the buyer, say, wait a minute, not so fast, Mr. Seller. I'll tell you what. Instead of you just letting the property go back to the bank and letting it be foreclosed on, what if I stepped in and I started making payments on your existing loan? So I would just start sending in the check that you would otherwise be sending in to the bank. And you give me ownership of the property. You were going to walk away and let it be a foreclosure anyway. In this case, I continue to make payments on your existing loan. And you actually get credit for the on-time payments I'd be making. Of course, if I don't make on-time payments, then that would affect you negatively. It would actually uh, lead probably to foreclosure or at least negative uh, inputs on your credit report if I'm not making payments on time. But I would make the payments on the loan and I'd make them on time and you would give me ownership of the property and we would leave the loan in place and the seller you as a seller would have a transfer of the property, so you would no longer be the owner, but the loan would remain on your credit report. Why would a seller do that? Well, what's the alternative in this case? The seller was otherwise going to just give it back to the bank. They'd have a foreclosure. Might transferring ownership of the property to you and having you make payments on a loan be potentially at least better? From the bank's perspective, could the receiving of the payments be better than having to foreclose and you know they they loaned $190,000 on the property by the time they get it back they're going to be less than that could that potentially be better for the bank potentially does the bank have the right to say wait a minute we don't want to do that they absolutely do in 99.9% .9 of all uh, mortgage uh, notes and deeds of trust they have what's called a due on sale also known as a due on transfer clause, which says that if there's transfer of title, which in this case it is, and don't try to circumvent it and say, I'm going to use a trust. I mean, those of you that are more experienced, they may be saying, I'll, just, I'll kind of just hide that there's a transfer. No, not a good idea. So if there's a transfer of title to the property, and in this case there would be, the seller would be giving you title to the property and you'd be taking ownership of it. And the loan remains in place. The lender has the right to be able to say, no, we do not want to accept payments from you anymore. We would rather foreclose and we would rather take ownership of the property or we want to be paid off. And if you don't pay us off, we're going to foreclose. They have the right to do that. It's in the paperwork. In 99.9% .9 of all you know, notes and deeds of trust. Okay? So if that's the case, the lender can call the loan due. It's called the due on sale clause or due on transfer clause. It's the acceleration part of that. Okay? So to recap, in this case, the seller would be deeding you the property as the buyer. You would be the new owner. The loans and the liens would remain against the property and remain in the seller's name. Okay? In some cases, not the example I use, but in some cases, this might be combined with owner financing. So for example, let's say the seller owes $170,000 to a bank and uh, you agree to pay him 200000 Maybe they'll accept payments on the difference between the 170 and the 200. So you may be making the payments of 100 or $200 a month in order to allow you to take over the existing loan subject to make payments on the existing first mortgage and you'll make payments to the seller with some owner financing. In this case, it would be second position owner financing. 
Okay, uh, very challenging to find these because a lot of real estate agents don't know what they are. They don't understand it. So most of the time you're manually calling sellers or the listing agent in some rare circumstances um, who would consider this. Okay. So there's a lot of detail to go into subject to. Um, this is not intended to be a comprehensive buying property subject to type of uh, you know, presentation or course or anything like that. But it is one of the strategies for buying creatively without getting new bank financing. You know, because you're not going in there, you're not formally assuming the loan. This is not a loan assumption. You are just agreeing with the seller that you're going to start sending in payments to their bank. Now, could the seller say, you know, I want to make sure that you're actually sending in payments to the bank. So what I'm going to ask you to do is go ahead and send me the check and then I'll forward it on to the bank. Sure. If they want to make sure that you're making payments, that's a possibility. Now, as a buyer, I would suggest that you make the check out to the bank even if you're going to send it to the seller. That way the seller doesn't cash the check and then they don't make the payment to the bank and they just kind of keep your money um, because you want to live in the property, you want to buy the property and you don't want it to be foreclosed. So you'd make it out to ABC Bank or whatever the bank's name is and you'd send it to the seller. Seller can then forward it on. Um, but most sellers that I've actually talked to about this um, eventually allow you to just send it straight to the bank because they don't want to be involved in having to forward that. Okay. So this is very controversial. You're going to want to talk to your attorney in detail about this uh, and ask some very serious questions if this is a strategy you want to employ. Nice thing about it is there's no formal assumptions, um, doesn't appear in your credit reports. Um, the property is appears on public record as owned by you because you do transfer title. Um, but you are agreeing to make payments on the existing loan. And you are helping out a seller who, in most cases, um, needs the help. So it's a, it's a good feeling type of situation when it's done correctly and, and ethically and honestly. Okay. All right. Let's talk a little bit about kind of some of the legalities of this. So as of April 5th, 2011, a little over a year ago from the time I'm recording this, the Colorado Real Estate Commission, and if you're listening to this in another state, realize that there may be similar laws. In fact, there probably are similar laws and position statements in your state regarding some of this stuff. So check with your attorney. I'm going to talk about attorneys in a minute. Check with your attorney and make sure that um, you're doing everything completely above board, honestly, legally, ethically, and that you are doing no harm to anybody. Um, but basically what this says is the Colorado Real Estate Commission has come out with a commission position statement on lease options, lease purchases, and installment land contracts. And I will throw in all the other ones. I'll throw in owner financing, wrap financing, uh, rent to own, lease to own, lease option, lease purchase, agreement for deed, bond for deed, contract for deed, installment land contract, and subject to into this whole pile. And basically what it says, and I've highlighted the really important parts in bold, um, but you can, if you're looking at the screen, if you're not looking at the screen, I'll go ahead and read you the sections in bold. Um, if you want to look this up after the fact, you're just listening to the audio. It is CP39, CP um, commission position, CP-39 uh, lease options, lease purchases, and installment land contracts from the Colorado Real Estate Commission. So you can go to your favorite search engine and look that up if you really want to read the whole thing. But the stuff in bold to kind of give you the summary. Uh, the commission strongly cautions real estate brokers to utilize the services of an attorney licensed to practice law within the state of Colorado. Lease option and lease purchase, and I'm just summarizing sections, so I'm not reading the whole thing. These are just kind of excerpts. Lease option and lease purchase transactions are complex and generally contain provisions with significant financial risk posed to the prospective buyer and seller. There is a significant potential for harm to the seller, buyer, or assignee if the installment land contract is not properly drafted. And that's just referencing installment land contract, but for any of these, there's significant risk. Seller retains legal title to the property while the buyer may acquire equitable title. The commission does not have an approved contract form necessary to memorialize the terms and nuances related to these complex transactions. So what that just said is, if you go to your normal real estate agent, you say, hey, listen, I want you to fill out a contract for me, making an offer for uh, you know, doing a lease option or a lease purchase or installment land contract or owner financing or wrap financing. Guess what? They do not have standard forms. And in fact, they should not be filling out the normal contracts. It says right there, the commission does not have an approved contract form necessary to memorialize the terms and nuances related to these complex transactions. Okay. Plus, it goes on to say, real estate brokers are prohibited 
from drafting a contract document that would reflect the terms of such a transaction as it would exceed their level of competency and is a matter requiring the expertise and advice of an attorney. And I totally agree, by the way. Goes on to say, such behavior may be construed as the unauthorized practice of law by the real estate broker and subject to civil penalties. So to think to yourself, well, you know, my brother's a real estate broker. I'll just have him do me a favor. Oh, no. Not a good idea. Okay. It goes on to say, the contracts for these transactions should not be prepared by a real estate broker. Rather, the documents should be drafted by a licensed Colorado attorney at law engaged for each particular transaction. My summary of this that I show all my clients that are doing these types of transactions, and I do it in big red text, is you will need your own attorney for consultation and to draft paperwork for all transactions that are not cash or traditional financing. So if you're not going to a bank and getting a new loan or you're not paying all cash to purchase the property, guess what? All of these creative transactions that you want to do, that you want to talk about, I can help you find them. If you're, if you're my client, I can help you find them in the multiple listing service, which a lot of agents won't, but I definitely can help you find them. I can talk to the uh, agents and explain to them how, how these creative transactions work in general, but you are going to need an attorney in order to do consultation with you and to actually draft the paperwork. So when it comes time for you to make your offer, guess what? We're bringing an attorney because I am not allowed, according to the Real Estate Commission, to do it. Okay? So realize that there's a little bit more complexity. You definitely can do these, but there, it's one of the reasons why you don't see a lot of these advertised is because real estate agents know that they're sort of beyond what they're allowed to do because you need to bring an attorney in order to do this stuff. And I definitely know no attorneys here locally that will do any of the six. You know, depending on how you want to structure it and what you and the seller agree on, um, you could definitely find attorneys who are willing to do all of them. All right, so let's quickly turn to talk about attorney options. Uh, so you will need your own attorney, again, for consultation before the transaction, consultation during the transaction, consultation after the transaction. You know, especially, I want to point out, you do a lease option, lease purchase, owner financing, wrap financing, you're going to want to, at some point, talk to the attorney and find out, you know, how does this actually work? Or, you know, so-and-so didn't do the repairs on the property. Who's responsible for that? There are things you're going to want to talk to them about after you actually close on the property. You know, especially if it's a two-step one. So you're going to have ongoing consultation needs. Um, you also need an attorney for preparing and reviewing your offer to purchase and preparing and reviewing transactional and closing paperwork, which may be two different periods of time. You may make your offer to purchase, like a lease option, lease purchase, and then a year from now, you may actually end up closing on it in order to have the closing paperwork. Okay. If you're working with me, I always volunteer and says, listen, I'll talk to your real estate attorney directly if you want, rather than you trying to educate them about what you're trying to do. If you want me to tell them about what we've talked about and how it could work and kind of bring you in, I'd be more than happy to do that. It'll end up saving you money because instead of having to you have them explain to you different options, you could talk to them and it's a much higher level conversation. It goes a lot quicker. And of course, attorneys are usually billing by the hour. So it can save you money by having you do that. So whether you have me do it or your own agent, but you can have your agent talk directly to the attorney to help work through that for you. Here are some attorney options just to kind of give you some ideas. Um, you can have attorney friend or relative. So if your brother is a relative, is your brother is an attorney, your sister's an attorney, your mother's an attorney, your father's an attorney, or you have an uncle who's an attorney, maybe they could do it for you. Um, if you have a friend of the family who's an attorney, maybe they'd be able to do it for you at a lower, no cost. Um, so that's one option. It's probably the lowest cost option. Uh, second option I like, prepaid legal services. It's a like a monthly fee. It's like 26 bucks a month. And you can get free consultation so you can talk to them about all your questions about them. Um, find out all the things you want to know and go through your frequently asked questions about how these work and how does it work for you and your situation. Um, and then of course when you actually go to have contracts prepared, they offer it at a 25% discount. Um, I'm a big fan. So I would recommend that. They'll also do a contract review for you. So they'll review any contracts you have that are not things prepared by them um, as well. If you want to get more information on that, you can go to my website if you want to or any other website that offers prepaid legal. But uh, you can go to mine. I will get paid a fee if you end up signing up for the service for doing this. So if you go to jamesor.com forward slash PPL, PPL stands for prepaid legal. So jamesor.com forward slash PPL. Um, that should actually take you to the prepaid legal website directly. And uh, if you use that particular link, then I do get paid a commission. 
Um, or the last option for attorneys is go hire a local real estate attorney. And if you're local here in Northern Colorado, I could definitely help you with that. If you're in another area, definitely ask your real estate broker um, and your friends and family for recommendations. I strongly recommend you be referred rather than just go get someone off the street. All right, let's talk quickly about finding homes. Um, as usual, I'm running behind on the uh, presentation. So what I'm going to give you is an OK, better, and best format for going and finding deals. So this is the OK list, the kind of the worst of the list. Uh, the worst of the list, in my opinion, is start by searching the MLS. Um, we're going to be talking about working with real estate agents for a very brief moment next. I've uh, kind of been hitting on it a little bit during the presentation already, but I'll kind of hi hi hit some high points for you and kind of go from there. Um, but know what your local multiple listing service, your MLS, can search for. Uh, in Northern Colorado, I'll tell you what that can do because I'm familiar with that. But in your own market, ask your real estate agent um, if they can search for these. And as an aside, I end up teaching a very large number of real estate agents that they can search for this because most of them don't even know that they can. Um, in, in many cases, at least here in our local market, they don't realize that you can actually search for a field owner financing or search for wrap financing, um, which is very frustrating because it also means that if they're taking listings from sellers, they don't know that there's a checkbox they should check off for the owner financing. Uh, but that's a different issue. So realize that you can do it. You may talk to a whole bunch of agents and they tell you, oh no, we can't search for that here. And then ultimately you end up finding out that you can search for it here and they just didn't know. Um, so you may need to talk to a bunch of agents until you find the right one in your local market. That may be almost as challenging as finding the deal. Finding an agent who understands this and willing, is willing to work with you in order to find the deal unless you're willing to do it all yourself. So uh, owner financing, really easy to find here in Northern Colorado. There's a search field for owner financing. Wrap financing, also very easy. There's a search field for wrap financing. Loan assumption, not so easy. You got to read the descriptions. You got to go call uh, selling. Uh, and by the way, for all these other ones, calling the listing agent or the seller is another way to do it. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But they're easy enough to find with the search field. You're not going to find that many here in Northern Colorado. You know, owner financing is probably about half a dozen, maybe a dozen. Wrap financing, fewer than that. Uh, loan assumption, like I said, you cannot use the search field. So you're going to have to read the descriptions in order to find those. Uh, for rent to own, there is a lease purchase check mark. Um, that's the one that you use to describe what rent to own is, and that's easy enough to search for in our local MLS. Uh, installment land contracts, got to read the descriptions, not an easy way to find, and subject to very controversial and very hard to find. So I would not uh, think that you're going to be able to find those in most of your multiple listing services. So that is the OK of the OK Better Best. Let's talk just briefly about working with real estate agents. Um, I've mentioned this a couple times. Only a small group of select real estate agents or real estate brokers are willing to help with these. Primarily because many of them don't understand it. They don't. They're used to doing traditional transactions, going to find a buyer who's going to go out there and get a new bank loan and buy a property traditionally, or they're going to pay all cash. There's a lot of extra work, as you probably can tell, having to call up listing agents and uh, call up sellers, and in many cases, teach them what owner financing, lease option, lease purchase, you know, all these different things are. You know, we've just been talking about this for an hour. Imagine having to do this every time you talk to a real estate agent on the other end who doesn't understand what you're even talking about. You know, you start talking to them about, you know, would, would your seller consider a lease purchase? And now you have to explain to them what lease purchase is. So a lot of extra work, a lot of extra time. Uh, only a small number of real estate agents would even want to do these. And then probably even a smaller group really understand it well and are willing to do it and, and know what they're doing. Um, one of the biggest challenges is the real estate agent commissions. Um, realize if you're not doing new bank financing, if you're not doing new bank financing, oftentimes there's the question of where is the money for the commission coming from, um, especially if you're trying to do these with low or no down. If you're trying to only put you know 3% down in order to do a creative transaction, because that's one of the appeals of doing no, no new bank financing, um, realize that the commission needs to come from somewhere. So you need another, in my opinion, you need an agent who's willing to help you outside the MLS too. Someone who's willing to work with you and find deals that are not necessarily a full 6% commission due, uh, where you can be a little bit more flexible. Um, this is really not intended to be a presentation on no down payment. I, I kind of do other presentations on those, but there's some subtlety in how you can additionally structure things with no down payment. So I check into those. Um, and one of the other reasons why working with real estate agents to try to find these is challenging is that A, there's more searching, there's more explaining and educating to the other agents and brokers, and there's more persuasion required in order to convince the seller to accept an offer that's creative than an offer that is all cash, 
we're going to close in three weeks, we're going to close in 30 days, and um, it's relatively close to full price. So there's a lot more persuasive ness persuasive tactics that you need to go in in order to convince the seller um, usually through a listing agent in most cases that uh, this is a good situation it's a win-win for all involved and consequently there's a lot more rejection so if you go out there and you have to go and ask you know 10 20 30 guys uh, listing agents or, or sellers about would you consider this and 29 of them say no you know, that's a lot more rejection than a typical agent sees, and so they need to be prepared for that, and they need to understand that. Um, and so a lot of times they'll do it, and they may ask three or four guys and get, you know, one really firm no uh, where, you know, listing agent is not pleasant, and a couple no's where there's, like, you know, plight about it. Um, but, you know, that could really turn off an agent from wanting to even do it at all. And so you need to have someone who knows that going in is willing to do it. So some challenges with doing that. Okay, back to the OK, Better, Best. This is now the Better list. Uh, we did OK before, which is primarily searching in the MLS. Better is asking for sale by owners. If you eliminate the need to have to educate the listing agent and to kind of work through that additional layer, um, Better would be going directly to people that have their houses for sale, for sale by owners. And the way that you find those is yard signs, calling on yard signs. You can also put up bandit signs. In our area, bandit signs are kind of frowned upon, so I would not recommend them here in northern Colorado. But calling on someone who has a sign in their yard that they have a for sale by owner, um, call them, talk to them about whether or not they consider something creative after you build a little rapport. Another way is Craigslist and other real estate websites. Craigslist is by far the largest as of right now. Um, so you can go read existing ads for sale by owners and call the sellers and talk to them and ask them if they would consider something creative. Um, and then also post your own ads up. So if you're looking for a lease option, lease purchase, consider posted in the real estate wanted section that you are looking for that type of transaction. Uh, the last one of the better section is newspapers. They're on the decline, but you could really look at the ads that are there or post your own ad in the newspaper just like you would on Craigslist. Craigslist is really replacing newspapers in many ways. So uh, those are different ways to do okay, better, and best. And this is the better list. And then finally, of the OK, Better, Best, we've got the best list. And this is my favorite way, and that's marketing to owners and then asking. So uh, finding sellers that have not necessarily put up their property for sale, so they're not quite for sale by owner yet. They are just property owners. So you contact them by sending out direct mail, postcards, and letters, or going door-to-door. -door. Make sure you know the law here in Fort Collins. Uh, there is a door-to-door -door soliciting law, so you need to be licensed. You need to be registered uh, with it and put up a bond. Um, but so know the laws about doing that here uh, or wherever you are. Uh, but marketing media for going door to door, you can do door knocking, you can do flyers, you could do post notes, you could do door hangers um, in neighborhoods where you want to buy um, creatively and then talk to the sellers and ask them if they consider something flexible. Um, there are other ways to do marketing, but those are my two favorites, direct mail and door to door. Okay, okay, better, best. Here's like the miscellaneous list. Of course, when you're looking for property, you want to be networking. You want to be talking to everybody you know and explain to them that you're looking to buy a house and you're looking for a, a flexible seller, someone who's willing to be a little bit creative and, and how they structure the deal. And so you want to talk to as many people as you know. Um, if you happen to be out giving presentations, for instance, I do a lot of speaking to our local real estate investor group. I tend to get people coming up to me and tell me about really creative transactions just from speaking. So if you're out there speaking, it's a great way to find additional deals. Um, and then the last one is part of the miscellaneous, and I could probably talk for a couple hours just on this one alone, uh, but I just don't have time right now. And that is find a real estate investor to talk, to take a traditional property, something that you could only really buy with cash or new financing, but then they buy it with cash or new financing, and then they offer it to you on a creative financing transaction where there's a profit in there for them, and you are able to get the flexibility you need in order to buy the property creatively. So you find a real estate investor who wants to buy a property, make a little return on it, you have them buy the property directly, and then you turn around and buy it creatively from them in a way that wins for everybody. Okay, that's it. I should be uh, just under time here. So uh, if you would like, if you haven't taken advantage of the world's greatest free gift, you can go to jamesor.com forward slash gift and get some information about the world's greatest free gift offer there, jamesor.com forward slash gift. And by the way, my name is spelled J-A-M-E-S. O -R -R com. So it's jamesor.com forward slash gift, and that's how you can get access to that. 
Of course, if you need to contact me, uh, if you like additional information or uh, you're, you happen to be local here in northern Colorado and uh, you're looking for a real estate broker to work with you, either on real estate investment stuff, which is really one of my specialties, or as a uh, owner occupant trying to buy a property creatively for yourself, my direct telephone number, 970-225-6989. Again, this is James or 970-225-6989 or you can go to my website at jamesor.com. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great night. Hope you enjoyed the presentation. Bye-bye for now.